In this video, we're going to explore the origin of three well-known kinematics equations. We've all seen problems like this, where we're given the initial velocity, the final velocity, and the time it takes to change, and asked to find the distance it's traveled. What's the first thing you think to do? You pull out the given values, and you open your reference tables to decide which formula to use. For most problems, you'd probably use one of these equations, but you probably never ask yourself where they come from, or why they work. We will release a cart down an inclined plane and collect data using a motion detector. So now we have data for position, velocity, and time. Let's look more closely at graphs of this data. Here we have a graph of velocity versus time. This data is easy to analyze because it is clearly linear. We can draw a best fit line and find its slope. The slope of a linear relationship is the change in the dependent variable over the change in the independent variable. For velocity versus time, this is acceleration. The acceleration from our data was 0.4 meters per second squared. To generate our first kinematic relationship, we can use the equation of a line. Our first kinematic equation now tells us that velocity is equal to the acceleration multiplied by the time. Oh. On our next graph, we have position versus time. If we look at our graph, we see that the slope is changing and the data is not linear. Our graph looks like y equals x squared, which in our case is d equals t squared. If we put t squared on our x-axis instead of t, we can see that our data is now linear, with the slope equal to the change in position over the change in the square of time. The slope from our data was 0.2 meters per second squared. This value is half of the acceleration we found in our previous graph. This gives us our second kinematic equation, which is position equals one-half the acceleration multiplied by the time squared. Oh. On our last graph, we have velocity versus position. If we look at our graph, we see that the slope is changing and the data is not linear again. Our graph looks like y equals the square root of x, which we can rewrite as y squared equals x. In our case, this is v squared equals d. So if we put v squared on our y-axis instead of v, we get a linear graph with a slope equal to the change in the square of velocity over the change in position. The slope from our data was 0.8 meters per second squared. This value is twice the acceleration we found from our first graph. Oh. This gives us our third and final kinematic equation. The square of the velocity is equal to two times the acceleration multiplied by the position. Here are all of our graphs. In our experiment, the cart started from rest. Therefore, our velocity time graph has a y-intercept at zero meters per second. Imagine we had given our cart a push instead of releasing it from rest. Our graph would look like this, and have a y-intercept that represents the initial velocity. Let's add this to our equation. Similarly, if our cart had not started at the origin, our distance time squared graph would have a non-zero y-intercept which would represent the initial position. In our equation, we can replace initial position with an equivalent expression, initial velocity multiplied by time. A y-intercept on our velocity squared distance graph would indicate that our car had not started from rest, which would appear in the equation as the square of the initial velocity. We hope that this video has helped you understand how the kinematic equations can be derived from real-world experimental data.